Whereas the beautiful is an opposite sensation. It's the, it's the smallness and the smoothness and the fact that it seems delicate and fragile that will recommend it to us. So a beautiful object will be a baby, a little lamb, a woman, curvy, smooth. The associations of sublimity are the opposite. Lar not, not small, but not and not just large, but immense. Grandeur will be the term used with sublimity. And it will inculcate a sense of terror in its, in its experience as well. Those two experiences are being contrasted in this period for the first time. I say more that ab about that in my lit theory course. Um, but the effect of this is to dissociate beautiful from the most beautiful. Like up to this point, when we spoke, speak of God, when we speak of the utmost beauty, we will say just the most beautiful. Like that's the English language, right? It's this is beautiful, that is more beautiful, this is the most beautiful. And that's the top of all beauty, right? Now we have a different experience. Beauty is one thing, the most beautiful thing, that can be one thing, but the sublime is seen as even greater than that and it's not a beautiful thing anymore at all. So it introduces the idea of uh, ugliness and horror as an artistic ideal. I think the effect of this is almost incalculable. I just wanted to mention it though. This is a sublime landscape. Tintern Abbey, we see the ruins of it here. Let's read the effect of it. Now we remember what I said about the romantic sense of innocence being good, experience being bad, and the fact that experience cannot be avoided. But the way in which we recover the goodness of the lost innocence is through the imagination. Wordsworth is going to describe that process in this poem. So let me read it. Five years have passed. Five summers with the length of five long winters. Famous first line. And again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild, secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood, wood run wild. These pastoral farms green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. Let me stop there. What's the impression of the first 22 lines on you? Immediate impression. What strikes you, if anything? I'm talking about your strongest impression. What how did you feel? Because that's the main question here. How did you how do you feel having read that? What did what impressed you? Now what did you think? How did you feel listening to the words? Sure. There was almost a sense of absence, but there was something else that was on there. Good. Okay. Very good. Sure. A sense of absence. Yes? Solitude, excellent. And peace. And peace, yes. Yes, 
Yes, you could imagine it, right? He was very good. Yes? You're kind of like alone in the vastness of this massive landscape. Yes. So a very solitary experience, it, it repeatedly emphasized. Note also the repeated reference to forms of silence. Note that, so line eight, the landscape is connected with the quiet of the sky. Uh, he goes on to say, I see these hedgerows, uh, wreaths of smoke sent up in silence and seclusion and so forth. Let me ask you a question. What sound does the sky make? What sound does smoke make? <laughs> you look at me blankly. But for a good reason. It makes no noise. But he's drawing attention to the noise of something that makes no noise. What's the effect of getting people to, ref to meditate on the sound of something that makes no sound is to pay attention to something that is inaudible, but you're paying attention and you're listening hard for it. And you can imagine at that point, you're brought to imagine what you can't actually with your senses perceive. That's the intention of the poem is to draw you in and to, to, talk, to take you inside to some degree, the scene. And there's all sorts of references and you mentioned them of seclusion, isolation, uh, from the beginning all the way to the end, to the end, there are vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods. Or a hermit's cave. A hermit is somebody who lives on his own. And <laughs> if you weren't sure about that, he says in the final line there, the hermit sits alone. Well, he's a hermit. Of course he does. Hermits are alone. It's the definition of a hermit. But you're drawing attention to the fact that he's alone. Again, it's drawing you to it. It's redundancy of phrasing is, my, is the point. It's called redundant. But it's not redundant for the purposes of the poem. It creates a certain effect on the reader. It makes you meditate. You attend to the spirit of things rather than the word. And that is reinforced not only by the references to silence, but even to this uh, grammatic feature that I mentioned earlier, the, the long dash. There's a soft inland murmur. The springs, may, you've probably heard this actually, if you've been near hills and there are streams flowing down, you can hear the water trickling. It's very quiet. It's so, but, the, but the dashes are interrupted thoughts. And the interrupted thoughts are expressing a feeling that can't be put into words. It's a sense of awe. How do you express awe? As soon as you express it, it's no longer uh, overcoming. But when you, a feel a sense of all you can't put it into words. You're dumbstruck. You're astonished. You're speechless. That's what Wordsworth is trying to describe here. And it's connected to a secluded scene that impresses dot, thoughts, thoughts of more deep seclusion. Well, how much more secluded than seclusion can you get? Well, the thoughts are more secluded than the landscape is. So all of it's pulling us inwards and aware of our feelings in this. So he's talking about a landscape, but the real landscape is within him and within the reader. Imagine this. Now note that he's writing this, yes, in 1798, because he's revisiting, but he's thinking about the last time he was here. Which was five years ago. And so this isn't just a, a one-off experience. He goes to this place and he's struck by the landscape. But five years have passed since the last time he was here. Now he's here again and he's reflecting not only on the experience of Tintern Abbey, but on the changes that he's seen in himself between the two visits. When you think about yourself, you think about what you're thinking right now, but you can also imagine the way you were five years ago. You'll, you'll identify certain events 
from five years ago. Maybe your birthday from five years ago would be an obvious one, but maybe there's some event, life event that would draw your attention. But it would be particularly strong if you came to the same place five years after you were in the place before, and it had all of these associations because he's remembering a ruined sense of himself. What's left now is a ruin. William Wordsworth, the adult. It, you, there used to be a William Wordsworth that, on which nature had not acted. Now nature has worn him down to some degree, and he, he's a different man than he was when he came five years ago. That's how he begins the poem. It's an extraordinary opening to the poem. He then reflects on them. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. But oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart, and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Nor less, I trust, to them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. That serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motions of our human blood, almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things. Okay, so now the reflection. Talking about the landscape, he's there again. He's not looking at the landscape. He's imagining what he saw because he's a few miles above it. He's not even looking at it anymore. He's pondering on that and then he's thinking about the effect that the last time he had uh, the effect that the landscape had on him from the last time in the intervening five years. Where has he been in the last five years? He says it right. Mid the din of town and cities. So this is a quiet, silent place. There he's been in noisy cities, places of civilization, places where the silence was not heard, places in which his feelings were not acknowledged. He would feel them where? In lonely rooms. There was something there that the noise and bustle of the city did not acknowledge. And he will say that those, the remembrances of those past times and that particular experience changed him. It had an effect on him that the that, went, that transcended what happened in the city. It stayed with him. And it made him a different man, and not only a different man, it made him a better man. Because it led him to a purer mind and with tranquil restoration. Note, the, again, the reference to quietness. And not only that, but rebirth. He'll be born again through this experience, by the way. And if that sounds like Christian language, that's because he's echoing Christian language here. And you'll, this will be particularly obvious in a few lines here. He's talking about the new birth. Now, in Christian theology, being born again is being given the Holy Spirit and coming to uh, believe in Jesus Christ. You, you, you hold on to him by faith. The Holy Spirit is given to you. It comes upon you. you. You confess that Christ is Lord. You are born again. Paul talks about it as the new birth. Right? Mentioned in John 3. That, right? To be born again. That comes when God 
comes upon you. You experience him. Wordsworth is not going to talk about it in relation to God. He's going to talk about this experience in relation to a sublime landscape. The quiet of the sublime landscape has a transformative effect. But it's quiet. It's, it's inexplicable. It is profound, however, and related to his feelings. Feelings to have unremembered pleasure. Maybe even things he didn't even, he can't remember. But there was something there. Such as, he says, have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life. His little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. So he didn't do any great deeds. He just did a small act of kindness. Where did that come from? Did it come from following Christ's example? Did it come from washing the feet of, of others as Christ did? Did it come from laying down his life for his enemies? No, it came from the experience of quietness in the presence of nature. He's attributing the same effect, not of a, the example of a man, but of simply experiencing nature. And a even greater gift or at least a more sublime gift. And what is that? A mood, which he calls blessed, in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and weary weight of all this in unintelligible world is lightened. When we suddenly see that there is a world that is below our senses, which we cannot perceive, the sublime, a light is cast upon it. It's lifted. The, the mystery is picked off it. We, it's an apocalypse, if you will. That's what apocalypse mean, by the way. Calypso, it was covered, and now the, the cover is taken off. Suddenly we see something transcendent in the presence of nature. The supernatural in nature. We, we, we feel it. And what does that do? It leads us to a sort of physical death which he calls being laid asleep in the body. And at that point, we become a living soul. Now, in terms of biblical language here, or bi biblical references at any rate, there are instances that Wordsworth may have in mind here in scripture of this same experience. Can you think of any? When is somebody put to sleep by God? Can you think of instances at all? I can think of three off the top of my head. Yes. Adam was put to sleep by God. Yes. When was that and why? Two. Genesis 2. Yep. And remember Adam, uh, all the animals are paraded before him. He names them and so forth, but there's no fit helper for Adam to be found. God says, okay, so... Asleep you go. And then he takes a rib out of his side. There you go. There's creation of Eve. But he's put to sleep. And it, uh, what becomes a living soul? At that point, a fit companion. First instance. Second instance, Abraham's put into a deep sleep by God. And a vision is given to him. A the animals that he'd cut in half, a sacrifice made, uh, he sees a torch pass between the, the pieces of the animal and so forth. So it's, a, it's an epiphany, a, a vision. That God is saying that I'm going to be the covenant giving God and whatever happens if any of us break this covenant what happens to the animals will happen to me because he goes through the they're, they're both supposed to walk between the parts of the animal only God does it he's going to bear the consequences of Abraham's covenant breaking but anyway put to sleep the third is in Daniel 7 where he, again he's put into a deep sleep and then he gets these apocalyptic visions of the future but the first one is the most important because we get a sense of creation going on. When Adam is put to sleep, Eve comes out as a result of this. Now Milton expands on this in Paradise Lost Book 4. He presents it as a dream sequence. I was asleep and then suddenly it was like a dream. I saw the, the one who I was looking for running towards me or maybe I was running towards her. And then I woke up and realized it was no dream. There she was the mother of all life. And I thought, wow, presented that. 
Now, Milton, Milton presents it this way. Wordsworth presents this in terms of the quiet effect of a sublime landscape in soul making. We are made into a soul through attention to our, our moods, serene and blessed moods. We are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. What is being said here is that to be born again in the romantic view is to shut your eyes to the physical world and the way things appear and to attend to the life that can't be seen, that connects all things between you and other people and you and the natural order. That's going to be the new religious vantage point that he will put forward. I will tell you right now, the technical term for this is panentheism. God is in all things. Wordsworth is a very spiritual writer. He helps us attend to spiritual matters. I've already said that Wordsworth's sense of spirituality is not the Holy Spirit. It doesn't lead us to Christ. It does help us attend to a spiritual connection that we have with the created order. But he will say that there's as much God in the water and the air and the trees, in other words, in nature, as there is in human beings. It's called panentheism. Now he goes on to say, now if this be but a vain belief, uh, yet oh, how oft in darkness and amid, and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan Y, the Y is the name of the river, by the way. Thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit, spirit turned to thee? And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again, while here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt from what I was, when first I came among these hills, when like a row, this is five years ago, when like a row I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, and he's remember, remembering himself as a boy, for nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by. He's, he's thinking of himself the way that girl was in We Are Seven. That's what he was like back then. He sensed that there was something there which he couldn't put into words, but he was not, he didn't love it. He was, it was almost like he was fleeing it because he, was, he wanted to grow up. He wanted to become like the adults. He didn't want to stay a child. It was more like he was fleeing that back then. And their glad movements all gone by, to me, was all in all at that point. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms, were then to me an appetite, a feeling, and a love and that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That's how it used to be when he was young, when he was still innocent. That time, note, note the long dash again, that time is past and all its aching joys are now no more and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint I, nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe abundant recompense. And now the famous lines. For I have learned, for I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity. 
nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit, line 100, that, imperil, that impels all think, thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. So what does he feel? He feels the presence of, for lack of a better word, God in all things. God's everywhere, at all times, in everything. There's no sense of God from a Christian vantage point being transcendent outside space and time. God is wholly imminent, or rather he is in the material world. There's the supernatural is in the material. He divinizes the natural world. But it's not, it's not the green stuff that's divine. It's something that he can't express that's in the greenness there. And it's in the air, and it's in the water, and it's in our minds, and it's in the animals, it's everywhere. Therefore, therefore, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. So this is, these are, he's giving a, he attributes a lot to these experiences, needless to say. It's not just his sense of being, but everything good comes from this. His whole moral nature comes from the exper experience of the natural, quiet world, remote from civilization. We go, literally, we go back to nature. But it's not the nature that creates the uh, effect. It's the imaginative recapitulation of being in the presence of nature. That's what affects the change. We, we meditate on what that experience meant. And that brings about a new way of living and acting. And, a more, and it's a moral one. So the effect of this, I talked about education, is that education hereafter will be to try to train children to be imaginative in conjunction with their feelings about their own nature and to live out their imaginations. Of their deeply felt sense of themselves and who they are. It's a paradigm shift. If that's the pattern of education, how can you teach it? Can anyone teach you to do this? Or will you have to teach yourself? It's a rhetorical question. It's obvious. It'll be child-centered. The child will lead his, own, his or her own education of necessity. Who's a better model for this than the orphan who has to fend for himself, herself? She doesn't have an identity that may not even know his name. You'll have to figure it out through experience. And then this will be the model of heroism that we'll find in comic book fiction. Uh, as I say, Anne of Green Gables is an orphan likewise. There's something about Anne. She's a free spirit who always in the end wins over the, you know, the, the establishment or whatever. That's presented to us as the paradigm for human life hereafter. It, as I say, it's a significant shift. Uh, I hope you found it helpful, and I'll see you next time. We'll look at a couple of 